to play to a doggy pile. Yeah, if it wasn't for YouTube, I'd test like a sailor too. It's actually trained me a lot. Hello world, how's it going? Hope you guys are all doing great. If not, hope it gets better for you. Today, I got a special treat for you. Eric Bodrock of All Oddball Aquatics shares his whole fish room. Well, most his fish room. It would have taken forever to get through it. I know this is a little bit of a longer video too, but it's so jam-packed with knowledge, tips, and all kinds of rare, cool fish that it was hard for me to really trim it. And if I would have trimmed it more, I would have just been cutting everybody else short. So, I hope you guys enjoy this. Let me know in the comment section below. Anyways, enough rambling. Let's get to it. It comes up a lot to me on how to feed freeze-dried tube effects worms to your quarries. Um, there's a big shortage right now on black worm, which is my mainstay for them. So, I'm going back to what I did when I was a kid. I get three cubes of tube effects worms, freeze-dried. You put them in the tank and squeeze them, and squeeze them a couple different directions, kind of roll them around a little bit. You can see some air bubbles coming out of them. Mm -hmm. Take them out of the tank, and then roll them around. Try to squeeze all the water out of them, okay? You, you kinda, you gotta play with them for a little bit. It's, it's in the aquarium hobby, nothing happens quick, right? Right. So you just kinda roll these around, and basically, like I say, try to get them dry again. Squeeze all that water out of them, okay? You know, play with them for 30 seconds, 40 seconds, or whatever, okay? If you just throw the cube in there, the, the quarries aren't going to come up and eat it. No, no way. If you squeeze, like the direction, squeeze the cube on the glass, um, the quarries might learn to come up and eat it, but once it breaks loose, it's going to float around, and the quarries probably aren't going to eat it. So after you work that around for a few minutes, just squeeze a pinch off, roll it into a hard ball, like so. Yeah. Like a when little you, pellet. Yep. Yeah, when you drop it in there, it goes yeah, right to the bottom. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah, and otherwise, keep, 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 your, keep your camera around. on. Keep, yeah. keep, keep, okay. don't run. They already know it's in there, oh, and they're already coming out to it. Yeah. They know it has here too. strong smell to it, and the fish just frenzy on it. And there's another one. Yeah. And the see. trick is you got to squeeze all the water back out of it, and then when you drop it in, it goes right to the bottom. I've already done talks where I talk about this and people will have tube effects like in the raffle prize or something. They'll get good a bowl of water and everybody will go around the table, take cubes and work cubes to try to get them to, to, to sink. Yeah, yeah, look how that's working. And it looks just like a clump of black blackworms yeah. sitting on the bottom. So they're familiar with it too. Yep. And that's the fish will just they'll just freak out on it like if it was black worms. Wow. That worked really well to break that up. And that was three cubes split up and feeding, you know, three groups of breeders or four groups of breeders. Yeah. Out of three cubes. That's a nice tip. And then you got all these foods over here. All yeah, there's... types of foods. That's nothing. And then you got this whole shell full of food. Yeah, I use a lot of Sarah foods. I like that stuff out of West Germany. Um, O nips, uh, catfish chips. I was just talking to Lucas here. Catfish chips. One of the main ingredients on these is willow wood and alder wood. Well, we collect alder wood or alder cones to use for our quarries when we're hatching the eggs. And then we collect it. We always see that the, the alder wood is dying. So what I just started doing is collecting the wood. I dry the wood out and then uh, let it dry for maybe a year or so, and then uh, soak it outside in the vats. Let it get waterlogged, and I use that. So I cut down on how much of this I'm buying. I don't have to buy decorative driftwood anymore. And uh, and I got alder wood for free. It works real good with willow wood too. Uh, Regina's playing around with farowellas or anybody playing like around. Like a willow tree? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, if you're breeding like farowellas or otosinclus or anything like that, those fish need to be, for them to comfortably spawn, they need to be able to get on a twig and wrap their body around it. So a small twigs of willow wood and apple wood is, is really good for breeding like Otis Inklis and stuff. 
Interesting. So, have you ever read Otocinclus? Uh, Regina's uh, did some of the uh, the, the like uh, subspecies of them before. Okay. But I haven't. They're too small for me. I don't play around with them. Right, I'm right. More of a plucko guy. Yeah, I had to ask because it's been on my bucket list for a long time. Yeah, they are breedable. It's just uh, you know you, you got to do it the right condition. Since you asked about it, one of the the things is you know you my big thing over the years is be the fish. Yeah. So we were talking to some of the European guys that that breed them regularly. And they said, what happens is if, the, if an otocinclus sits flat on a surface, its eyes are on the top of its head because of the way the body sits. Yeah. In nature, it's sitting on twigs. So what happens is if, when it gets on a twig, the head rolls over it. The eyes actually roll to the side. What? Now the fish can see around them and they're more secure. Wow. So if you want them to be secure, you give them that natural ability to get on small sticks. Yeah. Their head wraps around it, their eyes move to the side, and they can see what's around them. That's amazing. So you get the fish to be secure, then they're going to breed. If they're kind of always in high alert, breeding is the last thing on their mind. Right, right. So, I mean, again, be the fish. Little things right. like that that you oh need to God. know. Yeah. It's, it's just some, that simple to get them to breed. Right, and those are just things that we don't often think about. You right, know? All right. That's amazing. So... Very There's cool. so much of that out there. You just got to, like I said, sit back and think. Be the fish man. What happens in nature? Right, Talk to the right. guys who go collect it and see. Uh, I was talking to Lucas here a little bit ago. Regina and I were just down in Peru. And we've discovered my my systems, as you can see in the quarry tank here, these algae tanks are really bad looking. But I always paint oh, the underside yeah. of my tanks black and the background black. Because from I like that. My fish stand out on it. I can see the fish. The thing now is, though, and you can kind of see on this end tank here, when you're collecting in the wild, it's almost, when we were in Peru, we see no dark substrate at all. It was granite, light sand, some red rock, and gray rock. You see my background. Yeah. So what I'm doing is redoing my tanks now, and I'm using these three colors to simulate more of a natural environment for the fish to make them comfortable. Yeah. And you can see they're not washing out on it. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're really very colorful and vibrant. So it's it's not always what we like. It's you got to think of what the fish like. Right, and I so. often tell people that sometimes the substrate will make a big difference. Like rainbows, you put them on a white substrate, they'll wash out. But right, that's not always the case that a fish will wash out on a white substrate. Right, as this is proving here. So I'm 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 redoing my my call it my Peru look now, where I'm redoing a lot of my tanks, throwing a little bit of sand in there, and making the bottoms gray, white, red, tan. And all gray backgrounds. Yeah, and it looks great too. Of course, they're going to hide now. Yeah, yeah. Little stinkers. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be a lot of work to switch all my tanks over to that. But yeah, um, that's amazing. Some of them, at least the bottom that they're sitting on, I'm doing the, the red and tan, and some gray here and there. And also with these catfish chips, you're talking about how they actually change the ingredients in them too. Yeah, yeah. Companies change change their ingredients quite often. Um, you wouldn't think that, but but they do. Um, fish will still eat it. So if you're looking at the fish to give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down when they change the diet, you'll never know. So um, periodically, you might take a look at these ingredients and see what's in them. Um, the uh, cat scrapers I always use it. They've changed their diet. And there's, they're using a lot, from what I understand, a, a pea powder or something like that in them. And I used to feed that food, but fish love it. They still like it. But when I put it in the tanks now, you come back in the fish room two hours later, you, you're gagging. It stinks so bad. It smells like uh, rotting vegetable matter. So even though the fish like it, I ain't using it anymore because it's just uh, well, I don't you know, it's you messing know. up the house. You know, Ain't nothing worse, the worse smell than rotten vegetation. It's yeah. one of the worst up there. So, uh, yeah, so keep an eye on that. Um, yeah. You know, they're always trying to improve it. Um, maybe there are an ingredients that they're using they can't get anymore, so they, they change it that way. Um, cost of something goes up, and it's not economical anymore to do it, so they'll change it, knock it down. Or they, they, that may be used to be the main ingredient. It may be knocked down now, the words. It's halfway down a list of ingredients. So something to think about. Nice. Of course, they move down fast. Now those quick plecos sitting on the glass on the yeah, algae. Yeah. You know, on the on the underside of your glass lids, water splashes oh. up and you get that algae growing. Yeah. Turn the lid upside down. Let Brilliant. that algae dry for a day so it gets hard and sticks to the glass. Yeah. Put it in your tank with your plecos. They go crazy mm -hmm. for it. 
That is brilliant. Over the years, I've had people tell me, you can't do that. There's cyanobacteria on it and everything. Yeah, tell that to my plecos. They grow like crazy eating that stuff. Wow, yeah, they don't care. And it saves me from cleaning the glass lids, too. So. Right, it's like a two for one. Nice. Yeah, all my, my little fry get that. Uh, get that. They rotate the lids. The smaller the fry, the more valuable it is for them. Mm. You're keeping guppies in here with your people? Yeah, there's, the, there's just a pair of uh, all red albinos. Mm. Ever since I was a kid, I like guppies. So playing around with guppies. I love guppies, too. And more that they've been cleaning off. Yep. And you might notice the water a little cloudy because they were just been going crazy cleaning it for the day. Mm. Tonight I'll throw a five-gallon bucket of water in or throw the hose in it for a couple minutes and the water will be crystal clear Especially again. if you had enough light on it, it'd probably go green, wouldn't it? Yeah, probably. You can see the circulation of the pump. Yeah, the movement's moving and yeah. stuff around. So you can see that the bubblers actually do do something. Yep. That's cool. Man, we learned, you know, when we were in Peru, we heard, you hear people say that these fish are fine in fast-moving water mm -hmm. and they need a lot of current. Yeah. We collected a lot of these new ancestors coming down up when we were up higher in the Andes. And these fish are in water. It, it, the water is six, seven, eight inches deep. When you put your foot down, the current blows the foot, your foot six inches before you hit the ground. It's that strong a current. In those rocks is where you find the plecos. You can move over two feet where there's just wavy water. You know, it's not breaking the, 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 the surface. It's just flowing quick. Turn the rocks. The plecos aren't there. Go into the water, the white water's at, where it's really turbulent, that's where they're at. Hmm. So when you say fish like a lot of current, they like a lot of current. It's crazy. Yeah. If anybody ever has a chance, go and collect them. Put it high on your bucket list. Go collect them. You'll learn them so day. much. Yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Eventually I want to. I don't really want to do the Peru trip. It seems like everybody else does the Peru trip, so... I Papua New Guinea or Australia would oh, just would be, be amazing. That for would me. be a dream, yeah. yeah. Or I'd even probably go out. Uh, Africa may be a little too wild for me, but yeah. there's some cool stuff over there. That, yeah, yeah, definitely. Especially with Achilles and whatnot. Yeah, here's another fish we caught when we were in, in uh, Peru. Step around the other side of me here, real quick. Sorry for getting the view. But if you look in the sand here, you really don't see too much. Whoa. These are uh, cross areas. These were pretty high on my list of what to get. It's like saying there's ten of them in there, <laughs> and that's just they're uh, they're a uh, look at the barbels on them. It's yeah. feather. They're lip brooding uh, whip tails. So they'll hold their eggs underneath their lips. Yep. Yeah. The male will get uh, an extension on his lips to uh, to incubate the eggs. It's like the perfect gravel for them, too. Yeah, and there's just a little bit of sand in there. Yeah, but it looks just like their body type. Yeah. yeah. Well, they'll actually change colors, too. If you put them on oh, white okay. sand, they'll actually get, like, black and white. Okay. And, uh, I mean, that's fish's nature, natural mechanism to blend in, you know, camouflage. Right. There's and 10 adults in really there. they really well. Yeah, you wouldn't even thought it. I thought there was only fishers in there. Yeah. That is wild. Yeah, here's so, uh, one here. It's just been sitting out. You can see he's even darker because you see some of the black paint on the underside yeah, of the paint. Yeah, And the ones that are over on sand are just a solid brown. Well, what kind of tetras are those? Uh, Pando tetras. We collected those when we were done. Pando, yeah. P-A-N-D-O. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. There's some uh, mixed um, yeah, it looks like two types, types in, there. in there. Yeah. When you're collecting... Down here in Peru, man. Every body of water you go to, you're finding tetras that aren't in the hobby. Uh, some are good looking, some are great looking, some are pretty bland. And um, the problem with a lot of them is you're, you collect the stuff and then you bag it and then you're out for six, eight hours. When you come back, they beat each other up. Mm. They're chewing tails off, chewing dorsals off, chewing eyeballs out. And that's why so, they don't usually make it to the hobby. Right. It would be really, really labor intense and expensive to single bag them, single care for them the whole time you're down there. It's and that's just air moving all that water? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, those are uh, jet lifters, uh, Swiss tropical yeah, yeah. jet lifters. Okay. Huh. 
That's a lot of water it's pushing. For just yeah, they're, they're probably not clean right now either. There's one right here. Working. So they probably push a lot more. Yeah, huh? probably double that when they're when they're cleaned out. Yes. And, and you know, the trick there too is having a good size air pump. Yeah. That's a little feather thing. Yeah, it wasn't supposed to be that way, but no. there's a pair of hopalos in there that we collected. It's uh, mm. bean eyes. Mm. We try to breed those. Those are bubble nest spawners. Yeah. Check out that big killie that I got here. This yeah, you guys. Oh my god. This These thing is cool. Noema quii. They're uh, soil spawners. Look at this. These were on our bucket list. There's a couple of females there. This thing's huge for a killie fish. Like, the... This is probably about six inches. I would yeah, say. that's about four. That's the female. This smells coming out here give me a second about six probably yeah he's yeah. pushing he's pushing six inches Jeez, he is a monster i've never seen killifish so big look at that and beautiful too yeah he's he's bright orange let's see if i got a flashlight he's been spawning them in a Coconut fibers and uh, peat moss worked in, in trying to see which one works better. But he does have eggs of them already. It says they take about eight months to hatch. Yeah, there's six six to eight month hatch period on them. I won't know till the beginning of or middle of January. I start hatching some, and that's dry incubation as well. Yep. There he is. Come on, guy. And it's camera oh, there he is. Yeah, I see that orange on him. Yeah. yeah he he made a, fast. He made a mess of this now. Yeah. Beautiful fish. Just, a, yeah. just an awesome fish. They were only thought to be found in that area down in Puerto Maldonado, uh, Matra de Dios region in yeah. Peru. And, um, Anything that I've ever seen in a hobby or anything comes from that region. But just recently, they found some in Bolivia. Um, it's probably the same fish. I think they're, they're debating whether it's a different Moema or not. But it's probably the Kui'ai. And uh, they look the same. They all look they all look the same. Uh, you probably have to do um, still photographs to compare them to see if the spotting is different or something. But, yeah, it's that close. Yeah, yeah exactly. So we were happy to get, we got, we brought back two males and uh, five females on our trip down. That was, these and those cross Aloria carries you to see for our target yeah, fish. Behind us. Behind us. Anything less in here? Uh, there's a pair of uh, rivulets in there, but yeah, we'll never these see. They're really them. hard to find, yeah. These are some of those um, hopalos. hopalos we collected. Those other fish that are in there are. Um, Vicicera amazonica, the mm. Regina's breeding. It's a um, an unusual. There's one sitting in front of the it's like a like a whiptail mix. Kinda. Yeah, yeah, kind of like a uh, a um, oh, sinkless on steroids. They get to about right. eight inches. Okay, wow, so pretty pretty eight neat inches, fish. Right? They get like the, the the lighter colors you see on them get to be like a gold flicks on them. Do they stay skinny? Yeah, yeah, only that's about an long. inch tall. Eight inches long, or maybe an inch high. Wow, that's interesting. So pretty cool. Sitting on the silicones. Rainy fish, something you don't see very often. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my glass wasn't clear. Very unique. Definitely fits that oddball category. Ooh, what's those? Those are um, L494 Plecos. Mm, nice. We've been pretty busy. We were at the catfish convention, Youngstown auction. There's just been a lot of stuff going on in the fall here. So, mm -hmm. been kind of hopping. The tanks have been neglecting them up just a little bit. These are pretty rare, the Cali Siemens. I did a trade for those, fellow hobbyist. Hobbyist is one of the biggest part of this, uh, the fun of this hobby is getting to know people. Yes, exactly. I 100% agree. The community just, makes it all for just, sure. Just a couple pair in there. It's an Aeneas mm. type um, 
CW97, collected them in Peru. Mm -hmm. There's more of those hopalos scattered everywhere. And that's the same fish just washed out on the... Yeah. Or well, camouflage, I should say. The Peru look. Yeah. I like your aquascaping with the little uh, travel fern right on the rock <laughs> there. <laughs> I didn't plan that at the same time. <laughs> it landed just yeah. right on there, didn't it? I'm not a planner. <laughs> Sorry, plant mm -hmm. out there. These are some big quarries. Yeah, these are actually, um, they've just recently been de determined that they're actually uh, some Aquilus. I have no idea what that means, but it sounds good. Yeah, they used to be called a Corridor's Coriate. Hmm. And then uh, uh, Luis Tencott has, uh, did some scientific work on them and said that they're actually some Aquilus. Got these from Rob McClure. So it's it's still a quarry, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's yeah. just a different name. Okay. Yeah, that's that happens with all fish. They're finding stuff faster than the scientists can describe stuff. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to call it something in the meantime. Right. So CW numbers, C numbers, L numbers with plecos, LDA numbers with plecos. They're starting to give uh, A numbers to epistogrammas. Really? Um, you know. Uh, look how many rainbow fish are out there as melanotania species. Right, something, right. You know, which don't always look like melanotanias. So a lot of it is um, until somebody gets around to describe it. Um, unfortunately, again, like I said, there's so many stuff, new things being found. Usually the priority goes to the stuff that's really colorful and high in demand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Corridor C, CW111, the new zebra quarry. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have those? I, I don't. I wish oh, I don't anybody out there have them. I'm, I'm interested in them. I don't know. <laughs> they're uh, they're thousand dollar a fish probably right now. Wow. And there's a C CW146 that's collected with them. That still was a good looking fish, but it's not them. And some of the shippers are trying to pass them off. You know, that's a couple hundred dollar fish. So you got to be careful. A big difference between a couple hundred dollars and a thousand dollars. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, but uh, I just understand now that uh, Ian Fuller from Corridors World is going to start a funding project to raise money for scientists to have some capital to do their studies, DNA testing and things like that. That's good. And CW111 is probably going to be one of the one of the first that they want to work on. So uh, that'll be good. Start yeah. getting things organized a little more. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And are these the Nankies down here? Yeah. You're talking about, I heard you say Cheese Creek. I was like, what? Cheese yeah, Creek? these are, uh, these That's are Nankies. Uh, huh? uh, these didn't come from Cheese Creek. We got these okay. actually from an Oxbow Lake when we were collecting. Um, oh. 11 individuals that I personally caught, I kept separate, I kept them aside. I brought them back on, uh, on a, to check luggage with me, actually. And uh, I actually got fry from them already. So it's kind of neat nice. to collect the fish yourself and then uh, already have you know, fry them. that fast. Yeah, so. That's awesome. Just knowing they're already so happy in your tank. Because that Peru trip was how long ago? That was back in uh, August 15th. We came back early May. Yeah, it's not that long ago. Came so, back early May. Look yeah. how he's digging in the sand there. Just shoving his nose up in there. That's what they did. Yeah. Usually see them shift or sift, but not really <laughs> shove their nose quite that far down in there. That's cool. I love the setups. I just love how natural they are. Anything in here? That's some of the quee but the, it's that old male that's on his way. Oh window. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a horror guy. He's, they only live a year. From what I understand, they reach sexual maturity in eight weeks when they're ready to breed. So they go from fry to that huge of a fish. Well, now they probably start breeding at maybe two, two and a half, three inches. Yeah. So probably get up to two, two and a half inches in in uh, that eight week time period. You can see the orange on his fin, and uh, whenever the other fish. Like this is, you know how when fish get older, they kind of dull out their colors, but he's still got so much color on him. So it gives you an idea of the other one. Yeah. That's what happens when you get geriatric, right? Yep. That's it. Did in uh, Peru. 
these are cheese creeks you mentioned cheese creek a minute yeah. ago these are kind of a new hot pleco mm -hmm. look at that color on these things they're uh they're on the wood right now so they're darkened up but if you get them down on something light put them in a white bucket they turn uh like bright terracotta orange and brown okay. yeah you can kind of see it in the spots and on the things yeah, there they're spectacular I had gotten some of these out of Peru about a year ago, actually two years ago, and they started spawning for me. These are CW-16s. And um, the fry at, at an inch and a half are, are pretty spectacular looking even. So, deep fish. They're collected. Some more Cheese Creek and Cistrus. Everything's hiding out. Yeah, that's the, one of the problems with a lot of plecos in a hobby. They're um, they're always hiding. Yeah. There's some on the back glass here, maybe. Nope. Making a liar out of cleaners. me. Cleaners. Oh, there's one on top of the. Yeah, there's one in the back here. These are one of the ones that are found in really high high water flow. It's a juvenile. They probably get to about three inches or so. Um, it was a Amazonas magazine, maybe the. Uh, September October issue, Andrew Baumhagen has a um, an article in there on breeding some of the Andes plecos, uh, pretty similar to these. They're like so, almost solid black, aren't they? Yeah, they got spots on them. Again, they're sitting on that black background right now, so they're dark. Right, blending in. Uh, there's one of these that I'm actually spawning. When I got see the blue on that guy, you see some blue. Yeah, on the fins. like towards the lip too, sort of. Yeah. But there's, uh, I was breeding one of these fish. We'll see if we can get a picture of that. Here he is. We're actually just went into his cave. I'm calling these Araza blue flesh. I've already got these to spawn. A little bit hard to oh, see, but yeah. look at the blue on that yeah. guy. He's not going to stick around long. Mm, Hope you got a quick glance. So. Yeah, these, uh, these guys are pretty spectacular. When they came in, they were brown and gold spotted. Um, put them in a tank with the black substrate, the black background. They got real dark. You could hardly see any spotting on them. And then when they go into breeding mode now, the male gets all the all the uh, fins turned bright blue. You got a quick glimpse of them there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I strip the fry out when they spawn. I wait till the eggs hatch. I take a burnt baster and squirt the fry out. When the male comes out, he's almost an olive green with like kind of like milky bluish spots on them. They're mm -hmm. like they should be called like a chameleon pleco because they just turn all these different colors. That's wild. So these guys are breeding. I don't want to move them. I got two pair in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Let's not mess with them. Too but much. I would love to move them back onto my yeah. pleco, my Peru look substrate and background to see if they go back to that golden color again. Right. But that blue flashing color on them is uh, is pretty special. Yeah, those were neat. We barely got to see a glimpse. If you want to see it again, rewind it. Yeah, yeah. Mark the number and take a look at it, or right. send me an email and I'll show you some. Send you some pictures. There you go. Um, so yeah, those those fry have been available now. Um, the cheese creeks I've sold out of them, but I've been having some of those available. You'll start seeing some more of these fish coming out of Peru. Uh, Ian Fuller's doing, and Michael Barber, they're doing uh, go wild Peru. They're doing pretty good at getting people down there and getting some fish out. So uh, hopefully, start seeing some of this stuff show up in the hobby. It's nice to see some new stuff coming in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Got more Cheese Creek stuff up here? Yeah, there's a, a pair that I pulled out of there already. They're not in there. There's some um, some quarries, C-115 quarries in there. No, I didn't. Yeah, there's not many left in there. Mm. Actually, the tank right to the left of you has, you may have to step up on that milk crate. Okay. There's a CW-123. That we caught a boatload of when we were there. I'm sure they're all underneath that wood. I can't see. Oh them, yeah, yeah, whole plane of them. Oh, those are neat, kind of like striped. Yeah, and elegance. Different pattern. Elegance types. Hmm. But uh, we we brought we collected in one one hole. We collected I think 153 of them. Wow. And the hole was probably about three foot round, maybe 30 inches deep. And we're sure that the um, that water is going to dry up. Um, it was basically uh, that that hole, and then the water just drifted out of basically footprints. So those those fish, when we collected them back in August, they're they're gone probably already. And that's some of the alderwood in there, right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah anything that looks like sticks is is alderwood. 
Very cool. Ooh, this guy. What's this guy? The pickle. That's uh, the 494s. Just a few of them up in there. Always like those. Uh, there's a lot to see. Uh, you'd be here for two days videoing if you oh, I could to imagine. see every fish and every tank. I could imagine. There's some ancestral snowflakes up in this tank here. That one more over. There's, there's just a couple of guppies in there. That's those uh, those uh, blue uh, albino blue uh, uh, platinum yeah. guppies. Those are beautiful. Got those from Gary Musso. Nice, nice stuff. Good quality. Yeah, he's got great stuff. Where is that Pleco? Ah, uh, the Plecos are the next tank. Oh, there. okay. Yeah, the snowflakes are in here. Okay. Oh, yeah. The the intrigue with these things are that they stay small. These guys max out at three inches. Really, I like that. Yeah, real fine little plex. There, there. There's no L number to them. Do you have babies of these? No, nah, not yet. I'm still actually growing these out there. Uh, okay. They'll be my future breeders. And they get the bristles on them too, huh? Yeah, yeah the males do. Very the females cool. will get stubble on their face. With, uh, good looking mm -hmm. fish. And like this, so the intrigue with those is they stay small. So yeah. people are doing some of these 20 gallon nano tanks and stuff. Perfect fancy yeah. pleco for them. Yeah, definitely. Cool. That's pretty much about all in down in this row that's, uh, that's newer. Knock your socks off, interesting. Well, for all these people, yeah, it is. Maybe telling, not to you, but everybody <laughs> else. I was telling you about those <laughs> green guppies that came from. Yeah. Uh, Here, it almost does better without the light. You see, up. yeah, maybe the guppies do do better with the light. Yeah. Oh, there they are. These were the ones that came out of um, Stan Schubel's last of his stuff. It's a shame he passed. So I bought, bought about six pair of them, as you see, there's some babies starting to show yeah. up in there. And some size on them, too. And now you got a pleco in there, too? Yeah, these uh, these are actually new plecos. Get a picture of them. Nobody's seen these really too much in wow, the Wow, they got a little red on them? These, like, they're uh, gold. They're calling them gold on, star. Man. These were uh, fish that Ian Fuller collected. We collected a big female lawyer down there. He had a male already. And uh, look at that fish. Is that something? That is something. The eyes and the red. What is that? The fins? Yeah, the pectorals? Pectoral yeah. All right. Pelvic wow. fins, pectoral fins, yep. So um, we were down there. We collected like a six-inch female. He had a six-inch male at home. So he took them back. He had them for probably two weeks. They spawned. So uh, really? the catfish could bet He brought about 40 of them over to sell, and I ended up with uh, nine of them. So, and give them another yeah, year and a half, cool. I should be breeding them. There's one on the terracotta there, too. Yeah. If you need the light on or not. Yeah, hard to see out the light. But, uh, yeah, that'll be something new into the hobby, seeing uh, another one out of Peru, you know. Yeah. It's funny that we say that there's new fish, but about a third of the locations we went to down here in Peru were actually locations they never collected before. So any of the fish we bought, any of these ancestors are potentially being a brand new fish, first time in the hobby. So that's that's kind of cool. Yeah, you know, that's exciting. It, yeah, it might, yeah, might be introducing something brand new. That really gets you motivated to get down there and do it, right? Yeah. yeah these CW one oh nines we collected. Um, pretty good looking quarry. I mean, they look. These are probably my least favorite quarries. These this spotted kind of look because there's so many that look the same. Uh, these guys already spawned. I, I, I found one egg, hmm. uh, tiny, one millimeter egg, really, really little. But, uh, you know, my saying is they spawned once, they'll spawn again. So I think I got eight or nine of them in there. That's the group I'm keeping for myself, the breeding. And then when they breed, I always, as soon as they spawn, I took uh, TDS, the pH, and the temperature. So and is that usually the only time you test? Yeah. Yeah. Normally, I'm doing regular water changes. They're... My tap water is about 7.0. Uh, TDS is about 220 parts per million. Um, that water is pretty much standard. In, 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 it's the same in all these tanks. If something spawns, that's a notable time to take parameters. So um, uh, if they spawn and that's what they like, when, I, when I'm working with them, that's what I want to target. So you know, knowing that, that pH was 6.6, yeah. 6, maybe start working with some RO water. 
put some more wood in there, some alder cones, some uh, oak leaves, and work to get that pH down to 6.4. Yeah, and do it naturally, not chemically. Right, yeah. right. And then, um, you know, then start paying attention to them, pump them up with black worms or the tube effects worms, and, um, you know, then, then try to get a successful spawn out of them. But uh, you know they were happy, they spawned. So, right, that, you're doing something right. Right, yeah. so that's a good indicator. Mark, mark that, uh, those parameters. Thanks, Rod Eye. That's one you don't see in the hobby very often. No, you don't. I apologize for my lighting, it's not so good. There's some, some glitter, maybe geriatric. Uh, yeah. Some big old Look how active he is. Like some people will be like, oh no, euthanize him. No, look how happy he is. Yeah, they're actually still spawning too, getting yeah. viable, viable eggs out of them. I hope I'm still spawning when I'm a grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> camp size, you got some of the camp size in here? Uh, there's just a couple fry. I okay. all over in the other room. Because I got some fry of the camp size, but I don't have any adults. Okay. Let me check them out in the other room when you get there. Yeah. I was curious to see them actually it's alive. A, what is that? It's a Bedosha, a Madagascar okay. rainbow. Okay, just really, really old. I've never seen them on. that big. Yeah, yeah. very old. No, no, they That's got my that last thing. one, too. So This guy's nice. I remember we seen that Dicaceras. That's those 494s again. Okay. That you're looking at right now. Those uh, Dicaceras that we were talking about, the ones that look like a uh, out of sequence yeah. on steroids. That's the big one? That's an adult male there. Oh, wow. That's pretty neat. Whip, tail, Pico, auto mix. Yeah. Got assassin snails in there, dude. Yeah, anything? trying to get rid of all these darn uh, ram swords. Ram swords in Malaysia. Some goiter rivers. Yeah, we use we use flashlights all the time. My lighting is, isn't that good. And Goiter Rivers are one of my favorites. But you got a reason for that. For using the flashlights and keeping the lights dim. Right, right. Fish fish naturally, you know, there's cloudy days, there's overcast. Water's dark because there's tannins in the water, so they don't. They don't. A lot of these fish don't have bright, bright light over them. So again, you want the fish to be happy, or do you want to be happy? So right. if you're breeding, you want the, the fish to be happy. So um, a lot of the European fish rooms we, we visited, they don't have lights over the tanks. They'll have spotlights up over top, and then they'll move the lights to, to light up the tank when they want to see the fish or show them off or whatever work on them or whatever. So the, the lighting's more for us rather than the fish. That makes sense. That's a busy tank up here. Yeah, it's a bunch of guppies and some more of those L four ninety fours. I use the four ninety four fry to, to keep the algae off the tanks. So I throw them around a lot of the aquariums. Is there a more common name for the four ninety four or is it uh, they were called them Rio Paru uh, okay. before the L four ninety fours, but they haven't been described yet. I'm like halfway Pleco illiterate, so yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty the numbers, it's really hard to... These guys here, hi, not. we brought these back from Peru, the Plecos. Here's some of your favorites. The uh, there's the Lampi Conos. Ah, I love those so much. Dude, these guys are cool. Check them out. The yeah, that's some more of the um, the, the uh, cross Alloricarias that we collected. These came from a different location, so I'm keeping them separate from the other ones. It's probably the same fish, but... I don't want to mix them and goof up if they're uh, if they're different species. And kind of tetras are these? Uh, Phoenix tetras, filamentosus. Okay. Uh, that yeah. white sand, they, they don't look good, but they get a lot of uh, blue and red in them. Oh, really? Kind of like a Colombian uh, red-blue tetra. Oh, wow. So they're really not showing. Yeah, yeah, they're really washed on. They're mm. just, we, have, we have close to what, 250, maybe 275 tanks set up right now. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm out of room. Wow! You know, oh, I know how that goes. It's uh, if you're a fish addict, you're a fish addict. You uh, you can't have empty tanks. You no, know? It's, it's impossible. That's like a sin there. Especially if you're out collecting, I can imagine how much harder that would be. Yeah. It's nice to be with pisto. Um, yeah, those are cool. Are so? Is that what Regina had in her? Nah, she doesn't have any. Oh, of so these. these are different. Okay. Yeah, these are um, Elizabethia. I just picked okay. these up at uh, Columbia or um, Columbus auction. A few months ago, there's a nice male there. He's showing off for us. 
Mm. All the red on them. Pretty fish. And there's some green lasers or orange laser and green laser quarries in there. But these uh, the pistos get a little bit bigger than that, so I'm just kind of growing them up now. Mm. They're in they're in like straight RO water, so I'm keeping them soft. So when I want to start working with them, they're ready to go. So you don't even remineralize the water, or nah, it's there just was straight like. Yeah, hardly it, any TDS. Yeah, it's it's probably pretty low um, TDS really? and pH right now. Um, there's residue in there. When I first set it up, it was probably about five gallons of old tank water. So those trace elements are probably still in there, um, dwindling a little bit. Whenever I go to uh, to breed them, um, they'll probably just be straight RO. These uh, when we were in Peru collecting, we caught apistos uh, everywhere we went. We caught half inch, basically black juvenile uh, pistos in every body of water and it was amazing because the ph was usually around 6.87 but the tds was like nothing wow and uh there's leaf litter everywhere there's sticks in the water there's decaying you would think the ph would just be bottomed out but the ph is actually up pretty high because of it's being fed from up in the andes so you're getting minerals that are washing down in the water you know getting their getting them out of the minerals up higher um and it's staying in the water but you think about that, and it's thinking like, wait a minute, if minerals are making the water, keeping the pH at seven, the TDS should be the TDS should be up high, but it's not. So it, it kind of baffles you on, yeah, you know, how would I get t zero TDS and seven point oh? It's so, funny how uh, the more we do this, the more we're confused we get. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, now. sometimes. Yeah, sometimes you get stumped on uh, what's what the heck's going on. Now, when you run that straight RO, do you find it harder to keep your plants in it? Like, I noticed you have more plants in here. but when Yeah, you... yeah, most plants will probably just melt in there. Yeah, right because no mineralization for yeah. them. Yeah, there was, um, most of the places we collected, there, if there were plants in the water, they weren't aquatic plants. They were terrestrial plants that had grown into the water, you know, the swampy regions and stuff. Yeah. So they were more terrestrial plants, or bog plants, I guess they would, they would be. Mm -hmm. Um... But we found uh, some sword plants down there and, uh, you know, floating um, duckweed and stuff like that. But sword plants are pretty much the only plant that we found when we were down there. That's interesting. That's surprising, too. I mean, being down in South America, a lot of us that are in, like, a lot of the plants and stuff, we assume that they're just all over the place. <laughs> down there. They, they may have been, but, you know... Sorry, plant people. If I caught plants, they were just getting in my net and being a pain, <laughs> pain in the butt. So what is this? Grab, grab it and throw it away. Right? <laughs> it could have been something super precious, and I wouldn't have known the difference. Right. Well, that's how I'd be with Corys and Plecos. Is... That's the beauty thing about this hobby, though, is there's something for everybody, and there's so much of it. Yeah. And there's always something new coming out, too. Yep. Looks like you got all kinds of more signatures. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the autograph door. Yeah. Anybody that visits gets to sign the door. You could only imagine the signatures on this. There's quite a few of them. Wow. We did this at our old facility, too. We had a we had a guest book that people signed. I so love the idea. We put it on a door, so if we ever move, we're taking the door with us. Yeah. That's a great idea. Very cool. And we got three fish rooms and three doors. Once this one's filled up, we'll just start moving to another door. There you go. So. Very cool. All right, heading to the other room. Yeah. Right, you want to talk about this big tank real quick? Yeah. There's. Um, I mean, I know you see it a lot, but yeah, you uh, you caught a picture earlier of the uh, the L ninety sevens, the big yeah um, these guys. Yeah, the um, uh, Pseudocanthicus. This tank is really set up for them. Uh, there's a cave you can see. Back there, there's a there's a cave hiding out. I try to hide them because people don't want to see caves. But there's one there. There's one under these rocks, and there's one down on the end. Yeah, I wouldn't even know. Yeah, try to disguise them a little bit. And um, they're probably sexually mature. You know, over the years, a lot of people, I, I hear people confuse how big are they? Are they big enough to breed? And the size doesn't matter. It's it's the age. They need to reach sexual maturity by age, not size. So these guys are. These were F1s. Uh, Jim Kitchen up in Michigan spawned these. I got them as probably inch and a half in size. They're probably about three years old, so they're probably just reached sexual maturity. I'm guessing. Uh, I don't really do pseudocanthus, but generally most plecos at three years will start to breed. I've been seeing some activity 
we're, they're starting to shred up the tails and everything. So I'm kind of taking that as a sign. There's obviously um, different sexes in there. Some of them are the body is, is narrower and thinner. The head's more pointed. Some of them have a big blunt head and thicker bodies. Mm. So I really don't care how to tell them apart, but I know there's males and females. So that's all I need to know. They got wild mouths too. Yeah, uh, it's pretty neat. They'll um, if a fish dies, like one of the, like a two inch rainbow that dies in there, mm -hmm. you'll see them. They they'll, they'll like. They'll chew it up, spit it out, chew it up, spit it out. They'll do that 10 times, and then it's gone. They just inhale it. Wow. So I guess it's kind of like a, like a stick wow. of licorice or something, you know. Right. Kind of get softened it up first and then uh, and nail it. And, wow. uh, everything else in there, a lot of the rainbows are rainbows that I only had one or two of from a spawn, or I didn't know. I lost the label. And I don't know what they are. I used to have some cichlids in there, so they were in there for food. And then the cichlids never got to them, so they grew up. We did throw the uh, rose line sharks in there just because everybody was oohing and on over rose lines. Yeah, they're nice. The plant people were sitting there looking at those plants going, oh my God, those are the worst looking newbies I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. But that's about as natural as it gets, though, isn't it? Yeah, like, I would in imagine. the wild, there are, the plants are actually really mulmy in the wild. Yep, and they're getting chewed on. If we go away mm -hmm. for a three day vacation, we don't have anybody come in to feed. Yeah. The plecos will eat them leaves, the, the, the fish will chew on them. So, yeah, it's kind of my feeder, too. I love this tank. Like these guys are so fun to just watch. Yeah, they're 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 like uh, like clowns. They you throw food in there, they all kind of congregate, which you've seen earlier, and uh, they really don't chew each other up. They don't big open sores or anything on them. They get about full grown. They get about twice that size. Really? But um, you know, I'd be happy if they start breeding at this size, this age. And you can actually see them. For a pleco. Yeah. Like they're not just hiding. Yeah. That's why Regina likes them too. Yeah. And they keep those white spots through through maturity, in full size. And there was a cichlid? What is that? Yeah, it's a female um, nanoluteus, Arcocentris nanoluteus. Mm -hmm. I tried. I thought I got rid of them all. They were always in there spawning. What had happened was I set the caves up for the plecos to spawn, and I had uh, Therichthys iliati and, and those nanoluteus. They'd go in the caves and spawn, and they would chase the plecos out. Mm. So I'm like, well, that ain't going to work. So right. they, they get them out of there. And since it's for the plecos. Right. That's a beautiful fish, though. Yeah, it's a female. Very pretty fish. Wow. They got a bum rap. They, um, somebody put a common name on them as the uh, golden convicts, gold convicts. Oh, uh, yeah. So when they come up for auction, nobody right. buys them. Anybody here's come, they go, yep. like, no, yep, no, thank you. So I started a couple years ago on a campaign. I'm calling them dwarf blue eyed, dwarf <laughs> golden blue eyed cichlids. There you go. And I've been putting that on the auction tags and uh, see if we can get that name to stick. Mm -hmm. I've already seen convicts at auctions, a bag of convicts, and next to the label, between the bags, somebody puts two $1 bills in there. Uh, just to, to sell, to to get oh my car. lord! And it just sold for two bucks. Oh wow! Their money. Wow! It's a great. They're a great fish for kids mm. to start with. They yeah. reproduce quick. They're easy. You know, they're they're active. Great parents. I mean, there's there's a lot of pluses to them. But if you've been doing this forever, you don't want to see convicts. Right? Yeah. If you go to the fish fish auctions, you'll learn about that with the convicts and this is a, just a big matten filter that's on this or yeah there's two uh there's a solid panel in the front and then there's two four inch thick panels in there with mm. a probably a i think it's a 750 gallon mag drive okay and then i have one of those uh circulating pumps in the front there okay. just to keep water moving yeah yeah i like that and that's it looks a, natural too it kind of blends in there Kind of like a pillar to like a dock or a pier or something. Yeah. I got That's this cool. tank off of uh, Stephen Tanner. Is there a 3D background on this? It's a um, on the other side. It's a um, it's a it's it's sealed to the glass. It was uh, a man-made uh, something that came out of Europe actually. Okay. Stephen brought it back from Germany with him. The plecos have mauled it up and chewed on it since. So it's, a, it's like, a, I guess, a polyresin type thing. What are these uh, sparkly tetras? Those are uh, diamond tetras. Okay, that's what I thought. I just didn't want to sound dumb. Yeah, Regina did them for BAP, and then after she got Ooh. her BAP, we just threw them in there. So. Alanine? All right. 
Very nice. I love this tank. Okay. Here's your bundles of uh, alderwood. Yeah, taking these home with me. I'm going to try out the alderwood. Firewood. Yeah, Kidlin. Kidlin. firewood. Kidlin. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> All right, and check out this other room here. Yeah, I call this the, the, the Pleco room. It's I usually keep this hotter. This is, um, I usually keep the, the room temperature about 84 in here. So it keeps the tanks usually around 80, 82. Um, most of my uh, hyphen sisters are in here. Uh, Pacoltias are in here. Um, warmer water fish, fish it like a warmer. All the Peru stuff stays over in the other room. I keep that about 78, 80. So it's keeping the room temperature up in the upper 70s or water temperature in the upper 70s. But uh, zebra plecos are in here. Um, you've probably seen Lucas as one of his earlier videos has been in here. This room really hasn't changed all that much. Um, Fisher breeding. Um, you had mentioned real quick. You had mentioned about the campsi. There's yes, yes. there's some of the adult okay. campsi. There's a couple geriatric males in there, but yeah, there's only pretty decent looking fish. There's uh. Coltia compas in there, leopard frog plecos hiding out in all the caves. Oh, they're all over the place. Yeah, I got like five tanks of them set up now. Wow. Good sellers, so I produce a lot of them. Nice. These are those, what, that one fish you kept seeing, um, the 494 plecos. Yeah. They're in here. Um, and these are the ones that get that crazy hair. The males get the hair on the, the, the odonto growth on the back end of them. Oh, yeah. There's one in the cave there. Again, sorry, I apologize for my glass. Look at that guy going right into the cave there. Wow, that is wild looking. Yeah, females don't have it. The males. So are those pokey? Oh yeah, yeah, oh, they're they're like, like wire, like man. stickers. Yeah. yeah, but they spawn pretty regularly for me. Here's a batch of their fry mm -hmm. here that I pulled up just a few days ago. So we get an underbody shot. That's cool. So they're still holding the yolk sacks. Yeah, I need to get some wood in there. That's this is the time now to put some small pieces of uh, driftwood in there and uh, some seasoned leaves. Right before um, they lose their. Yeah, even at that size now, they're probably going to start rasping on that, and they're going to start feeding on it. But more importantly, is they they take that biofilm and stuff into their gut, and that jump starts their um their the biological system in their stomach, so they can start digesting and processing food. Mm. A buddy of mine was uh, Charlie Mueller was successful in spawning a Pseudocanthicus, and okay. uh, he got like a thousand or so fry. So I went over the other day and I grabbed some from them. Um, they're supposed to be pretty difficult to raise, so um, I got about seventy or eighty of them from them, and I'm giving my taking a crack at raising some of them. Nice. So you can see I, I got the wood in there already for them, yeah. so they can start. As soon as they can, they're going to start rasping on that it. Bacteria, right? Yeah. And even even though like ancestrous, they're more of a vegetable eater, or hype ancestrous, they're more like zebras. Even that are more of a, a carnivore. When they're juveniles, they'll start rasping on that wood and leaves. So just don't think because they're meat eaters, they're not going to rasp on wood or leaves. You know, it's important to get it in there. Very cool. What are these up here? The uh um, species uh, Moorhead River. Okay. Big old male. Yeah, your rainbows are getting huge. Yeah, I've been cutting back on breeding them right now. I'm kind of getting pressed for time and space, and uh, the, the, the plecos are the big craze. So, you know, doing this for a living, I gotta, you know, whatever, selling and making the money, I gotta pay the bills. You gotta feed them fish somehow. Yep. And what are these? These are the oh, these are goldie eye cure. Yeah, they're they're not colored mm -hmm. up. They get a fantastic amount of orange on them. But any of you rainbow oh, guys yeah, know you got to get them in the first hour of the morning. To, oh yeah, to see the color on them. And yeah, I got these from Hans. When I got them from Hans, I got fry from them, and they were the, his first batch of fry. It's about a year ago, and um, he had just collected them. Uh, when he was over there, like uh, uh, two months, three months before that, That's your so it's nice to get some get some new stuff. Yeah. Is that a zebra? No, nah, that's a uh, a 236 uh, hype and sister is 236. That's one of the ones from my bloodline I've been working on. I'm, I've been striving to try to get my own super whites, and that's Ooh. that's about as close as I've gotten on on my own. That's a nice looker. Yeah, it's a good looking fish. Yeah. 
Those super whites. I do have uh, a super white. Uh, we'll get to it here in a few yeah. minutes. Yeah. So we'll knock your socks off. I'm excited for that. Man, lots of caves and hides. Yep, let them pick. Yeah. You know, I keep the rainbows overhead. You've heard this story before. That makes the fish feel comfortable. Um, knowing it, that's secure overhead, that there's no big predators in the area. So like a dither. Right. So the, the plecos and quarries, whatever, they see those up fish overhead, they know it's safe. They can come out and swim freely and not worry about somebody's going to try to eat them. And when do you usually collect your pleco eggs? I collect, I let the male hatch them, okay. and as soon as I see a tail wiggling on an egg, and you just take a baster and squirt them out. So they're just spaining their tail, then you have to Well, yeah, you, I go through every day with a flashlight and, and look for spawns. Okay. So it's, uh, once once they do that, then I, I take a post and put it on the tank that there's eggs in okay. that tank. So I know to check it, you know, even a couple times a day. A certain time frame and whatnot. Right. Or... And then as soon as the eggs hatch, um... I squirt the eggs out and they go into one of these new marinas that we had just seen. What the advantage of squirting the fry out when they first hatch, and it's basically just an egg with a tail on it, they don't stick. They'll, they'll wash right out. If they hatch and they, even like two or three days later, the head develops, they start developing the sucker mouth, they'll, they'll stick, man. They're, real you would pain, think huh? it's an egg with a suction cup on it and you can't get them out. Yeah. It's difficult. So um, get them as soon as they hatch, and then you don't have to worry about them uh, sticking to the, the inside of the cave. Now, is there an average hatch, hatch rate for placos? Or nah, does it varies. It varies so on the species. Yeah. You know, zebra okay. placos, you're getting 5 to 10. Yeah, I think my biggest one on zebras was like 13. Um, depends on the size of the fish and what type they are. You know, it really can vary. These rainbows are nice up here. Uh, that's, I think these were my favorite. Al and oh, I. Yeah. They're my uh, favorite, too. I got a two, just stuck a bunch of them in a 240. And I'll tell you what's really nice about yeah. these is that you can throw some mops in there. The fry will grow up with the parents. Really? They don't. Yeah, they don't eat their fry. Really? I've never got that lucky. Yeah, I've uh, I've had that happen quite a bit with them. Mm. I'm not looking to pull fry, so I, a lot of the rainbows I don't have mops in there. Yeah. But usually with mops in there, I'm sure that night the plecos are probably coming up and eating uh, rainbow eggs. So. Oh, I'm sure. I love that fish. So colorful. And the bigger they get, the better. It's one of my nicer, more popular plecos. These are these, uh, the honeycombs of Vobin Mooster. There's a nice male right there. This guy hanging out here. Yeah. Now, did we see him over on the other side? Uh, no, I don't no, think there's okay. any over there. That one's not showing particularly good color, but uh, very popular fish. Mm -hmm. We'll see some more of them. I have them set up in about five or six tanks. There's uh, two thirty sixes. Wow, the top fin, the dorsal fin on that guy is humongous. Yeah, goofing me up with the light here. These rainbows are nice. Puppy, what's Eggs. this fish? <laughs> what kind of fish is this? Dogfish? It's Puppy. Mackenzie. Next, where you going? <laughs> You're just going to sit on me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> really powerful. Come on over here. Take a look at this fish right here. That's my nicest fish in the, in the house. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Wow. Big old female. Oh, and, my goodness. And I got, uh, there's a male in there, though. The, the parents of the male that's in there came from Hans Evers, and uh, the the male's like 90% white. The female has quite a bit of striations on her, but the parents of the so, female from the Greg would be the grandparent of the the male is one of the ones that Robert Bedrukin's working on. It, it came out golden color, and they're just. They're just spectacular. Interesting. But that's uh, that's what I call a super white right there. You know, the, yeah. the bands are gone and it's it's snow white. I'm gonna light them up. So that's you. the female right there. Yeah. And then the male's probably. He's usually right next to them, but okay. could be anywhere in there. There's one in there. that may be the male. There's a one with more stray. Yeah, yeah, there. that's the male right next to the. Cave. Okay. But there's only a pair in there. Okay. And there's another pair in here too. It's not as Those nice as that amazing, one, though. though. These, These are, are hiding. 
the, that female came from Robert oh. Budrukin, and there's a female in here that came from Robert. Be, yeah, they're going to be tough to, to see. Mm -hmm. But that female, she likes to hang out there, so I'm pretty happy with that. These are all uh, honeycomb ancestors in these tanks. It's a trio in here. A uh, trio in here and five of them in here, two males, three females. Mm -hmm. and we got more uh, the uh, leopard frogs, 134s, are set up in here. A bunch of them. When I knew they were going back on the band list, I... Um, Oh, they I stopped did, up huh? on a bunch of them again. Yeah, they're down in okay. this tank too. You can see what I was talking about my problem with Malaysian yeah. trumpet snails. There's a, it's like a big female just came out there. The ones that have those real fine lines like that mm -hmm. are the uh, Jacksonman, something like that. They're found um, one one of the one of the locations are found in a river. One's found in an oxbow lake. Huh. And that distinguishes whether the, the thick bands or the squiggly lines. The squiggly lines are the river ones. The thick banded ones, I think, are the ones that are found in the uh, in the Oxbow Lake. But it still has the same name. Yeah, yeah, it's the same yeah. fish. It's just uh, color changes they've adapted to their environment where they're collected at. Interesting. You're you're gonna find out um, a lot of these plecas, a lot of the hypencistris, like the Rio Shingu stuff, the sixty uh, sixes and three three threes. They've already done. Uh, DNA testing on them, they're the same fish. Uh, they've developed differently because they're found either slow-moving water, fast-moving water, they're found on boulders, they're found on wood, whatever. So they develop different finage on them or different colors. But DNA said they're the same fish. Um, people don't seem to want to realize that or recognize it. But you're probably going to end up finding like 236s and a bunch of them are probably all the same fish. They're just... Um, you know, wherever they, they ended up landing, they they uh, environmentally have changed. They've adapted to their environment and uh, got different color patterns, different finish, things like that. That's so a lot of DNA testing is going to be getting done here probably in the, over the next five, ten years on a lot of these ancestors. They're, oh, I'm sorry, the Placostomus. They're, they're here in the hobby to stay, and people want to know what they got. Right. So that's going to drive scientists to, to start studying them and, and describing them and stuff. I know it's been named done for quite some time. Yeah. Well, they, they keep finding so many new ones, you know. Yeah. So Makes it hard to keep up. Something's got to be done. Yeah. These guys right here, Charlie Mueller. I don't know if you can catch. There's one I see right next to the cave there. Yeah. These are uh, three of sixes. Uh, Panoculus um, Klostenfeller. Klostenfeller. Mm. These guys got yeah, Ooh, like this guy up here. Look at the orange. Oh, one my here. Lord. They just get screaming wow. orange colors to them. There's another one in there. Yeah, there's okay. one. Oh, there's a bunch of them. I got. I think I got 14 of them in this tank. Been growing them out. They're probably about a year and a half old. So mm -hmm. probably got another year, year, year or so before they reach sexual maturity. But they're all over the place. These look like the the the, the L397s are real popular. These are like the super duper version of them. These just have. Red orange color screaming on them. Yeah, that was vibrant. Very cool. Centeniensis mm -hmm. rainbows. Brought those back from the UK. Yeah, those are hard to find. Mm -hmm. Check out these over here. Yeah, get the door closed. The, the, the fry system looks um, looks a little empty right now. I've been selling quite a bit. Um, again, we had all these conventions we've been going to. There's a couple of fish in here. I mentioned this bench of the 397s here a minute ago. There's some fry in here under the look how orange those guys are. You already got the color. Yeah, very, very pretty, very colorful. And that's a good way of telling this fish, the 397s from like L002. The L002 fry at that size have nowhere near that color um, under the same conditions. You know, I feed baby brine once a day. They're getting a wide variety of like rapashi foods. And, and, and you've seen all those pellet foods and stuff we feed. These tanks here, I take flake food. I put the flake food in my hand and I stick the hand in the tank and squeeze my hand. It gets waterlogged so it sinks. These tanks are all linked together with a, an overflow. So... I gotta get the flakes to sink. Right. So um, 
even with a good diet, OO2, um, don't look that orange. So um, sometimes it's a good way of determining what your adult fish are by telling what the babies are. That holds true too with uh, a lot of quarry species. You know, a, a two month old fry will, will tell you what the adults are. And when you can't tell what the adults are, you know, uh, Ian Fuller does line sketches uh, in his breeding book of like the fry in like four or five, six different stages of development. So uh, you wouldn't think of it, but using the fry to identify the adults is, uh, is pretty handy. So, interesting. See somebody's up there bouncing around. Yeah, those are uh, 75s of AI. Oh, that was him that was just bouncing around. It was oh, like he's yeah, stuck in he's there huge. Or something. They have scared the daylights out of him. Mm. Yeah, there he's at. Yeah, those they're in a seventy-five now. Oh. There's seven of them, and I got to move them to a uh, a one twenty-five. Give me some more room. How big do those get? That's as big as ones I've ever seen them. There's, okay. there's some in there that are probably about nine inches, ten inches. Mm. So. Oh. This guy on the bottom, same one. Yeah, yeah. There's, I think seven, seven or eight of them in there. It sounds terrible. I don't know. But too many fish to get the crap. This was. Uh, you said you didn't remember seeing this the last time you were here. Uh -uh. This is kind of the, the way the Europeans do their zebra plecos. Uh, throw a big colony in. Put a bunch of caves in. Do a lot of hiding places, which are the brick, the smaller holes for fry. And just feed the daylights out of them. Good water. I got the temperature at about 92, 94 degrees. You can feel it's warm. And 92, uh, 94. Yeah. And supposedly wow. when they're found in the wild, it's that warm. Wow. And uh, yeah, let's see if I can get them breeding again. Everybody that, that anybody that knows me or seen any of these videos knows that we moved into this house about six years ago, and since I moved, I haven't been able to breed them. Um, at our old house and my old hatchery too. The retail location I had, we was bringing them without really any difficulty. Mm. So uh, something's going on different with my water supply or, or something. I can't put my, I've tried everything, splitting them up in pairs, trios, smaller groups, bigger groups. So mm. I figured if this works for the Europeans, it'll work for me. Right, hopefully it does. It looks yet. like it would. Yeah, if I was a zebra pleco, I'd right, be happy right. there. You know? <laughs> yeah. There's all kinds of spaces. Yeah, these, uh, I guess there's a little bit low on fish right now. There's some more of those, uh, some more of those, um, oh, so it's catching all that flash. Down. Yeah, yeah, this is some fresher stuff, so it's mm -hmm. it's floating. How long do they usually take it to sink? It, it depends. Some of it will sink within a short period of time. Some it's a little bit longer. Okay. You can see I'm eating at the, it's all the yeah, the you wood, can see how they wood crap in there. Yeah, yeah pretty, pretty low on fish right now. I guess we've been having a lot of events here lately. Yeah, There's some cool. nice um, Regina Spawn, the Pleco uh, L52s, Vicacera 52s. Some Corys. Yeah, there's Ooh, a bunch it of is warm in this room. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Here's, um, I like the heat. This is a uh, Cory uh, CW69s. They look a lot like a Sturbi or a, oh, yeah. like a Gossii. They look like a bronze body. Yeah. Gossii Sturbi mix, sort of. And they That's do. That's spotted one. There's a couple of uh, 40, um, 45, C45s mm -hmm. in there. And there might be a couple of C150s in there. Mm -hmm. Remember, I was telling you about the tanks here. Underside of this tank has that nice green algae on yeah. it. I'll flip it upside down. Actually, it's pretty dry. I'll flip that upside down, let it dry till tomorrow, and then throw it in with my, my some of my plecos, yeah. and they'll just go to town on it, man. Excellent food. All right. Anything else you want to show? Yeah, I think we pretty much uh, pretty much covered everybody. All right. I'm starting to get hungry. Yeah, my stomach's growling. Me mm -hmm. too. That's actually, um, that's a, a, a male ram, but they came from all blacks, the black knights. Oh, really? Have you ever heard okay, of Okay, yeah, those black knights are getting really popular right now. Yeah, the, uh, it seems as though the, 
when they spawn, only a small percentage of the males are black. Oh. The males kick back to the to the wild color. People like to know that because I know a lot of the uh, black knights are getting really hot right now. Yeah, yeah, it's a neat fish there. Um, yeah. And the females got some nice spangles and sparkles on them. They don't look to see seem to really be that sturdy looking to you. They're not no. robust, not full body, not still needs work on it. Yeah, either. they're uh, But when you put the light on them, yeah, they're all that spangles and everything on them. Yeah. yeah. They're spectacular fish. That's beautiful. But um yeah, I think with the playing with the genetics got them a little uh weakened and or whatever. I don't like man-made fish. I don't like flower horns and stuff like that. You know, cross and stuff, two different species. Line breeding, I don't have a problem with. You know, selectively breeding. I kind of look at line breeding as kind of an attaboy and you've got dedication because it takes years and years and years and years. Meticulous notes, knowing what you're crossing with what. You know, what male, what what female, what grandson, breeding back with the mom or grandma or whatever. And it, it, it just takes a lot to uh, to get something that you're striving for. So line breeding, no problem. You know, selective line breeding, no problem. And you're taking two different two different species of fish and cross, and they're doing it with stripping synodonis now and all that. We don't need that. No. There's enough beautiful synodonis out there. We don't need to make new ones, you know. I agree. So... It's just like rainbows too, you don't want to mix those. There's so right. many yeah, beautiful exactly. ones out there. Now antlers and guppies, yeah. I think they've already gone so far, yeah. it's almost too late to really... Yeah, people will argue it, because it's the same thing with like sword tails. You know, the original sword tails, they got across them with a plague to get rid of them. Right. And then, then they stayed, but they originally down the road, that was man-made. You know, it was two different species across. Mm -hmm. So people will argue with it, but... Um, you know, like I said, all those we have so many beautiful cichlids out there. You don't need to be making flower horns and stuff. That's not my cup of tea. And you know, knowing I know a lot of collectors and stuff, and new fish are being found all the time. So get the new stuff. You know, you don't have to go to man-made. Well, awesome. All right, so there you have it, Eric Bodrock's fish room of all oddball aquatics. He also has a website, www.alloddballaquatics.com. If you're looking for some fish or something like that, he may have something for you. Um, hit him up, Regina and Eric. They're uh, really, really, really great people. Awesome, awesome people. And if you haven't seen Regina Spotty's uh, fish room tour that I did before this video, highly recommend you checking that out, especially if you enjoyed this one. Lots of rare fish. And yeah, it was a great time. I love going over there. Love hanging out with them people. Always wish I had more time to do so. But anyways, I got more fish room tours coming out for you guys. So like, subscribe, share. That would be awesome. Because there was a lot of fish in there that uh, you just don't see. But anyways, enough rambling. Until next time, everybody. Peace and have a great one.